welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. at Libraries Turn the Page podcast. I am Jessica, one of your hosts. My library co-host is Jen. And uh, as I mentioned, this is Turn the Page, but we're going to call it Burn the Page on Turn the Page because that is the name of the book um, who the author we're going to talk to today had written. But um, I am going to actually allow her to introduce herself uh, because I think we're going to get too excited if we have to do it <laughs> ourselves. Right, Jen? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> sure. So my name is Danica Rome. I'm the Virginia State Delegate from the 13th District of the Virginia House of Delegates. Grateful to represent the people of the city of Manassas Park and the western Prince William County portions of Haymarket, Gainesville, and my lifelong home, Manassas. I'm a third-term state legislator who, in 2017, unseated a 26-year, 13-term incumbent who is the self-described chief homophobe of Virginia to become the first out and seated transgender state legislator in American history. And my pronouns are she and her. I've passed 32 bills into law during my two and a half terms in office. And uh, I was also a reporter for 10 and a half years um, before running for office, uh, you know, just covering the federal, local, and uh, state governments. And now I am also an author of the book, Burn the Page, out through Viking Books now. And uh, this dropped on April 26th. And Burn the Page, the title itself, is trying to encourage you as the listener here today to set fire to the stories you don't want to be in anymore and to own your own narrative so that other people aren't the ones telling your story, but rather you are. And when I first ran for office in 2017, I did not come from central casting as an out transgender metalhead reporter, Yogini stepmom vegetarian who was driving a $324.92 Dodge Shadow America while unemployed and uninsured living in Moss house. At 32, typically that's not exactly where a lot of people see their life coming, but at the same time, I also knew at the time that, hey, look, elected government isn't the sole domain of the rich and powerful. It's for us too. It's for the people. And so I launched a campaign and 10 months and four days later, we ended up winning by eight points and we changed what's possible in American politics together. But this book goes so much further than just politics. In fact, politics is only a little bit of the book. A lot of this book is just about self-growth. It's about some of the wild stories of just like my personal life and stuff. But really, Every chapter starts with a hit of opposition research against me or a bad newspaper headline about me or an editorial or my favorite parts are the attack ads that I dealt with. And really the whole point of that is to flip the script on that negativity, flip the script on other people trying to tell my story for me so that I was the one who was in control of my narrative all while t talking to my now constituents about traffic, jobs, schools, healthcare and equality, taking care of their day-to-day -day constituent service needs. Because to me, politicians who attack their constituents, especially those who attack their most vulnerable constituents like trans kids, they shouldn't be politicians anymore. And the people who are inclusive leaders need to step up and be ready to run for office. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Um, it's a great introduction to the book and to your career. And I'd like to start with a little bit of a, um, a broad question about the book itself. Um, you know, there are so many subgenres of memoirs out there. There are political memoirs and there are music memoirs and there are even like yoga memoirs, you know, like there are so many different kinds of stories people tell about themselves and yours is like a little bit of, of all these types of books. And that's something that I think is, you know, that I found very powerful about your memoir is that like your, your journey encompasses the metal scene and journalism and activism and public office. And, you know, I think as somebody who found their career calling in their like late thirties, personally, it's very reassuring to hear that your life doesn't have to be like a direct line between points A and B. And I'm wondering if like, that's something that you could address a little bit. Absolutely. So first, thank you for uh, the review that you actually wrote where you were talking about the same thing, because uh, I actually happened to come across that today. So that was Yay! Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And, oh, yeah. And also, by the way, quick shout out to those of us who have uh, tattoos on our left arms, because like, that's the thing. <laughs> and apparently you also have text, uh, Jen. Mine is the uh, 
Equal Rights Amendment that says the quality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. What is yours? That is beautiful. Um, mine is from Coraline by Neil Gaiman. It says, be wise, be brave, be tricky. Oh, I love it. I <laughs> love that so much. That is so cool. Thank you. So, um, but just to talk about like kind of the mashup of genres and everything. Well, my life hasn't been linear. My <laughs> life is not one thing that just fits in one little, little peg. And I suspect for a lot of the people listening to this today, maybe it's that your life isn't just defined by one thing. Maybe you're multifaceted and there's a lot of different interests, hobbies, or experiences that you've had. Maybe you've gone through a lot of trauma and loss like I have, and maybe you've experienced a lot of joy and a lot of fun like I have as well. Perhaps if you're trans, you know exactly what dysphoria is all about. But even if you're not trans, you also probably have experienced at some point other people trying to project an image about you to you that you don't recognize as your own. And in Burn the Page, I tell a lot of stories about trying to come to grips with a lot of, you know, whether it's a text in a campaign or in my case, being a closet case kid, being too scared to tell anyone about who I was and just kind of going along with some of the displays of toxic masculinity, for example, that I would see just as a survival mechanism. And really being in a place of vulnerability where I knew exactly one out person by the time I graduated high school in 2002. You know, it's just, I like to think that in all the experiences that I've had since then of, you know, being in a band that toured in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and there's some very funny stories about that in the book. I hope you all enjoy very much. Uh, that was fun to write about. <laughs> uh, lots of cuss words were used. <laughs> and, uh, there's other stories about, you know, like going to concerts and being 14 at my first show and being completely shocked at some of the things I was seeing with my little Catholic school eyes. And at the same time, I also think that there are some kind of deeper moments that end up coming where, you know, when I was coming out to my mom, for example, on my 30th birthday, and she just said, like, I'm just worried about how you're going to find someone. And then it was because I came out that I actually met my partner and I had told her that night, well, actually I have a date coming up next week with this, uh, like trans guy who's, uh, you know, like originally from Finland and everything. And, um, and yeah, we've been together ever since. So, you know, just, there is a lot of sadness when you understand and really know the trans story of America right now, where trans women tend are so often brutally assaulted and killed. And I had to cover two horrific slayings of young black trans women in Montgomery County in Maryland between 2015 and 2016. And I'm viciously well aware that every door I knock could be my last, I, I know that. But I'm not gonna put myself in harm's way necessarily, You know, try to take good safety precautions as I'm going out. But I also think that for all of the sadness that we do experience, you know, as a product of a society that just does not love us enough or at all. And in different cases, we do find joy, we do find love, and we do find a way to make things work. It's not a universal story. Some people's families reject them when they come out. Other people's, you know, partners will leave them. Some sad things happen, but it is also just as possible that someone might because they're now being their authentic sense of self might actually be able to present that to the world and someone else might see that and be attracted to it. And that's what happened in my world where, you know, I, I wrote about in the book pretty in depth about how hard it was for me to date while I was closeted. It was very difficult. And once I actually started going to therapy to deal with, you know, my gender dysphoria and I started transitioning, suddenly I'm putting myself out there in a very authentic way. And it became a lot easier to meet someone just based on an introduction from a mutual friend. So, you know, I, I just want to give people a lot of hope with this as well, where if, even if it's hard, I can't tell you everything will be better. What I can tell you is my story. And I hope it inspires you to share your own and to live your own as your own. Going back to also when you, when you talk about um, childhood and just you know, um, how your mother managed to take you all of these places, how you, you know, were, you traveled um, was pretty, pretty great. It's just, you know, a, a good story about, you know, just like who, like where you come, where, where you came from and, 
like you hear these um, these stories, oh, you know, like small town girl makes good Virginia and people think, oh, probably never left the area. But I love that your world was opened at such a young age. Yeah, I mean, so this is kind of an interesting dichotomy, right? So my dad killed himself in 1987, two days after Christmas. When I was three, my sister was five. And he left my mom with a brand new mortgage that she just got back in May of that year. So she had a mortgage, two young kids to support. And then within the year, her, both of her parents would move in, one of whom had Parkinson's, her mother. So my grandmother, who I lived with, you know, for you know, a couple of years there, she ended up dying by the time I was seven. And so, you know, I had gone through losing two immediate family members in my household you know, by the time I was a kid, you know, by the time I was seven years old. And so along with dealing with that loss and everything, and I wrote about my mom's ex-relationship that ended in the nineties um, and that it was turbulent as well. Well, to at all the same time, my mom very much was intent on making sure that she could have vacations where she took my sister and me and just go to different places, experience different things. And even though my politics, my mother's politics are very different. <laughs> uh, my Fox News watching the labor union hating Republican voting mother who last voted for a Democrat for president in 1976 and quote, that was a mistake, as my mom will say. Uh, even still, I developed my love of travel, in fact, from, you know, where my mom would take me out and like my grandparents on my dad's side had actually visited all 50 states. They loved to travel and when they died in 2006, 2007, you know, my sister and I, we got a small inheritance from each, you know, it was enough for me to like basically go fund a vacation. And so like I flew to Northern Germany and like went to Hamburg in my first Wacken open air uh, festival. And, you know, I'm actually looking at uh, what's kind of funny from that is right as I'm saying this, this was not planned. I've got uh, two of my little plastic tankards from uh, going to Vakit Open Air back in uh, 2008, 2009. Nice. Uh, that just so happened to be sitting here as decorations. Um, I don't drink that. Oh, one, I don't drink beer anymore. But second, I definitely do not drink enough to fill up a liter of that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a product of my 20s for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, that love of travel also, though, and going over to festivals, it made me want to be on the stage and not just watch what was going on on stage although I still do love watching a good show and because of that that led me to eventually getting my band over to Scotland Northern Ireland in 2012 and that tour proved to me that I was willing to move mountains to achieve whatever my dreams were and all of this a detail in the book pretty you know literally it, like uh, in a linear fashion in that regard and then you know by the time 2017 came around I had already moved major mountains in my life repeatedly to follow dreams. Like one was going to a place a, a couple, few hundred miles away when I skipped my junior prom in high school to go meet my first love in person. So that was a, that was a track in and of itself. I was 16 years old, never driven further than the county next to me and be like, oh my God, that was a, <laughs> that was a trip. And then, you know, I had that thing in 2012 of going overseas. My transition was obviously a huge one, and that's still ongoing to this day. Of course, even though I started, you know, therapy in 2012 and I started HRT in 2013, you know, you constantly transitioning your whole life at that point. And then the fourth major mountain I ever moved was running for office. And I think that altogether, you can actually see how these things kind of lined up. And that love of travel, in a way, from you know when I was getting the exposure that I had. Like my mom took me to Edinburgh when I was like seven years old because she won British Airways tickets at work. Edinburgh <laughs> is one of my favorite places on the planet, by the Edinburgh way. Edinburgh is my favorite place on the planet outside of the great people, the 13th district. Of, of course. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's the part. But um, what I would tell you, though, is uh, when I go to Edinburgh, I got a ton of friends over there. And it's the people that make it along with the history, along with when you're walking down the Royal Mile or you're walking up to the castle and you see uh, it carved into one of the walls, an American flag from the, like basically the Patriots who are being held captive there during the Revolutionary War. It's incredible when you digest all of that and people who are digesting a lot of scotch and whiskey along the way as well. That's a different part of incredible for them. 
Um, but for me, uh, going to Scotland is about the people. They're so fun, so crass with their humor, which is totally my style. Like, absolutely love it. And they, uh, you know, we could not get a gig in England to save my life. It, like nowhere in England was interested in having us. Scotland, they were just open door. Like, oh yeah, what do you want? <laughs> it's so like we got like Aberdeen and Glasgow and Edinburgh, and uh, yeah, I've been to Scotland uh, five times, and uh, I cannot wait until travel uh, back over there is a thing to do again because I want to go so badly, and I haven't had a uh, since I've been since like, my first campaign. I haven't had a you know like proper two week vacation. Since 2014 i think yeah yeah i think it was yeah, 2014 was last time so it's been a long time and i want to go back so bad and this time i want to visit the highlands because i'm a huge outlander fan. oh my god yes <laughs> oh i yes. read all the read all the books all the davina porter audiobooks and even the lord john series to go along with it and everything Thanks. oh yeah yeah totally into that so that, that that that's a whole other podcast we could do together <laughs> <laughs> well you know we'll pencil you in for whatever you want yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, even for uh, for for Christmas, uh, my partner got me a signed Diana Gabaldon book. And that was uh, I was just like, oh my god! <laughs> and now I'm signing books. I was doing that last night. My my kickoff book launch last night. So we had like a hundred people show up in Alexandria. It was great. Oh, and so I was sitting there, and I was just like, oh, I remember Diana has an actual sequence, like a thing that she does for having books, like you know, processed <laughs> in a very efficient manner when she does. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, oh yeah and keep on my partner also works at a library as a uh as a number as assistant too Yay! um so oh yeah yeah so <laughs> like this is uh, uh, uh there's always books to be had whenever there's they are needed <laughs> yes <laughs> That is so cool. And, you know, what? one of the through lines that I really see in all of these different things that you've discussed from the music career to journalism, to your transition, and then to campaigning, um, is that like all along the journey, you've been, um, you know, making your own communities, finding communities, and then using these communities in order to help you like achieve your own goals and also communal goals like for the community. Is that something that you've been like aware of or do you see that as a through line in your life? Yeah, I mean, to me for the sense of community with that, it's left as you go, right? It's not mm -hmm. just that I want to achieve things just for myself. It's I'm bringing people with me. In Scotland's case, I wasn't gonna let my bandmates financial, you know, problems, you know, individually anyway get in the way of my dream of playing in Edinburgh over at Bannerman's bar. And, you know, like it was, it was, it was amazing. And I was like, all right, well then I'm going to do what I have to do. And if that means that I need to be the leader who's responsible for booking everything. And I mean, dealing with the immigration barristers, getting the passports and, and, and like with the entertainment visas. And trust me, there's a whole thing in the book about the absolute horror show that it was about trying to get all of this stuff. And I'll even add it's to that. So I was 27 years old. It is summer of 2012. And I'm at the British consulate in, uh, in New York City. And come to find out when they, the day that our plane is supposed to leave, they had missed one of the entertainment visas. They didn't process in time, even though I had paid for it, the, you know, for them to expedite it. So I go up from uh, Northern Virginia to DC to New York, bring my drummer with me because his was the one that was missing the passport. And I threw a fit <laughs> at the consulate to the poor guy behind the screen who's just like, oh, we haven't processed it yet. I go, you haven't processed it yet? And I just dropped into my finest Southern. I was like, okay, here's how this is going to go. You see, I'm going to come back here. It's noon right now. I'm going to come back here at three o'clock. They're going to be ready at three o'clock right? No, no, no. I don't think you understand. They're going to be ready at three o'clock because y'all close at five, right? Uh, yes, yes. We close at five o'clock today. And y'all ain't going to be open this weekend, which means they're going to be done today. Now, excuse me, I'm going to go out day drink and I'll be right back. <laughs> so I come back at three o'clock and I don't have empirical data to back this up, but I believe I'm the first person to ever black out at the British consulate after three liters of beer and be trained because I found one of my friends from college and it said, hey, man, you want to meet me over at this uh, German, uh, like basically just a German beer house. And it's like kind of near Third Avenue and 45th, I think. And uh, 
yeah, so uh, that happened. And uh, I got back to the consulate and sure enough, the passport's ready. So from what I was told, I slid my fingers under the little window and got like a fingertip high five. And I started high-fiving all the security guards and yelling, we're going to the UK, blah, blah, blah. Uh, come to on the subway. And this is all in the book, by the way. So you, you'll have a lot of fun with the actual details of this. And uh, there, is, we'll just say hilarity ensues as I uh, repeatedly do not remember that we have gone to the consulate, picked up this thing or, or already. And I'm like, Jacob, what time is it? It's like, oh, it's, it's, it's four o'clock. Jacob, we gotta get to the consulate. We gotta get, we already went to the consulate. We already got past. Oh, okay, I see how you go. Jacob, what time is it? Four, we gotta get to the consulate. And he's like, we already went to the consulate. We already got it. Oh. And so now I'm celebrating on the subway, and this guy just comes up like, "You need to get control of your friend." <laughs> and my my drummer. So this is before I publicly transitioned, so he didn't know he was like misgendering me at the time. But he goes, "I don't know him." <laughs> so, like, I'm not even upset over that particular misgendering as much as I think it's hilarious because I would have thrown me under the bus too for acting like a jackass. And, um. Little did Jacob know, because he had never been in New York before, that we were supposed to be heading back to Newark Airport, and I saw a plane on the map, and so we ended up toward LaGuardia in Queens, which is definitely not New Jersey nor Newark. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was a, quite a little adventure that we had there. <laughs> this was the most fun political book that I have <laughs> ever read. And I mean, no offense to the other political memoirs that I've read. No, lots of offense to the other memoirs. They could have been <laughs> But, <laughs> but uh, you know, you're no dead in a row. This book was so much fun. And, you know, Jen and I were talking just a little bit about how different the approach was that you took to writing this type of book, to writing your story. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. I was a reporter for 10 and a half years, right? And so like, what's so funny is, in the book, you'll even see in the epilogue, um, I, like I have a, you know, so every chapter starts with one word of identity about myself, right? Um, and whether it's been ascribed to me fairly or not, or it's something that's actually germane to me. And um, there was a mailer that came up that attacked me in 2017, among other things on there, when it started off with like, Dana Carone, born male, has made a campaign issue out of transitioning to female. On like black background with like red scary font and everything. Well, one of the hits on that piece was Dana Carone wants a book deal. And uh, I was like, I, okay. So first off for me, I would have written that as unemployed reporter wants to keep writing. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's kind of what I did my entire career. So it's just a different medium now. And I wanted to put that piece on the book jacket itself so bad. And uh, we had a compromise and uh, we put it in the epilogue instead. Um, and I thought it was hilarious. So yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe it should have been like transgender candidate got a book deal and <laughs> earned re-election twice and now is promoting the book of the book deal called Burn the Page out now through Viking Books. You have, to find, you have to find whoever did that sarcastic voiceover and be like, listen. <laughs> oh, if you listen, if you get the audiobook, you get uh, the full eight plus hours or whatever of my dripping sarcasm, just like nonstop. So I strongly encourage your readers who uh, enjoy having very awkward laughs while you're out walking your dog or something, which is one of the uh, things someone wrote back to me. Like, I kept laughing and my dog is through with it. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, please enjoy the audiobook. And by the way, support your libraries because I love the libraries are carrying this as well in its audio uh, version, as well as the ebook, as well as the hard copy. Because look, there's the part of me that's just like, hey, look, for those of you who can support me directly by picking up a copy, awesome, love it. But at the same time, the resource of the library to get it out into the community in general, it's unbeatable. And I, I am so into that, absolutely support it. Mm. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you for plugging libraries. We always love that. Yeah. 
And, um, you know, when you were writing this, uh, your life story, and, you, you know, obviously you talk a lot about like owning your story and using other people's stories in order to tell your own and to really own it. Did writing your life story, did it feel like transcribing something that you had already processed, like a story that you had already figured out in your head? Or did you feel like you were making discoveries and figuring out stories as you, as you Definitely wrote? the latter, because, mm -hmm. uh, I never had 320 pages of text all neatly lined up in my brain at any given one time. Uh, and here's the thing, when you spend your whole career writing about other people, um, when you have to turn it around and write about yourself, it becomes a lot more difficult, not necessarily because of how you feel about yourself, but you're very, you can become very protective about the people who are not public figures, but are in your life because you don't want someone who's not comfortable with their name being in print to, you know, have their sense of privacy taken away from them or for them to say like, hey, I don't want this, you know, having to navigate those boundaries, which required me to use some pseudonyms in some cases in order to, you know, complete and tell the stories. And in other cases, you know, just talking to people I'm like, hey, I got a really funny story. And it's like, well, yeah, it's funny. I would prefer if you not told, you know, talked about that. And I was like, look, I got plenty of other things, you know, I can, I can write about, you know, it's just trying to figure out that balance between wanting to tell a true, accurate story. And at the same time, wanting to be respectful of the people in my life as I was doing it. Because when you write a book that mentions a lot of other people, at that point, it's not just about you, it's about them. And when I'm writing a story that's quite literally about empowering other people to tell their own stories, I can't tell mine in a vacuum. I need other characters, more or less, to uh, include in a book like this. But I also want to leave room for some of those people that if they want to tell their stories, they can feel empowered to do that just the same. This was awesome. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And I am so grateful for you, both y'all and for your podcast. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been Jen and my co-host, Jessica, in conversation with Danica Rome, author of the fabulous Burn the Page, now available at an independent bookstore or a library near you. And I heartily, heartily suggest you pick it up and give it a read because it is really funny and perceptive and yeah. moving and it and full of adventure and, and it makes me it made me want to listen to metal <laughs> yeah yes. yeah maybe want to go back to like 2002 and listen to everything i listened to in college <laughs> oh 2002 was my golden age of metal especially and i will give you a very quick top 10 of uh of 2002 uh so please. Please, hey it's podcast you got the extra time right there's, yeah. no, there's no limit on this so in no particular order i'm just going to kind of try to come out uh, number one, Coma Lies from Lacuna Coil, absolutely changed my perspective on music. Number two, Wages of Sin by Arch Enemy. Again, different, but also a uh, female fronted band, amazing melodic death metal. Uh, Swedish band with German singer, or vocalist, I should say. Uh, number three, The Art of Balance by Shadows Fall, American made metal that is so, so good. And I just love that record. Four, uh, Damage Done by Dark Tranquility, a purveyors of Swedish melodic death metal, amazing record. Five, the Cold White Light by Sentenced, uh, which is a very sarcastic album. And it's also dark, it's deep. It's got so many different different layers and emotions to it. It's amazing. Uh, it's six, Crowned in Terror by The Crown, another Swedish, very fast, thrashy, like death metal band. But it's the one that at the gates' his vocalist, Thomas Lindbergh, actually performed on. So it's so, so cool and amazing. Uh, seven, uh, Soil Work, my God, Natural Born Chaos, one of my all-time favorite records ever that was produced by Devin Townsend who also did backup and guest vocals on Black Star Deceiver which is my favorite Swedish melodic death metal song of all time then eight you've got the absolute opus opus or opus of opus the deliverance album the first two songs are wreath and deliverance amazing record so I love all of those and um oh man I could just kind of keep riffing off the top of my head, but that was like, what, what is that, eight? Um, 
what else can I uh, uh, pull out of uh, ye old rear from that? <laughs> 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 I'm suddenly coming to a very quick block. Oh, hey, Perseverance by Hate Breed. That's another uh, 2002 record. That was uh, absolutely fantastic and very upbeat, very fun. And I got to see that live uh, actually that year in Buffalo. And they, play, they played a Rager set. So they played like every song in the whole catalog. It was super fun. And uh, and again, this is all off the top of my head. Uh, but then number 10, a very landmark album, was Meshuggah's Nothing album, not because I thought it was their best, but because it gave birth more or less to the whole gent movement, D-J-E-N-T, of all these eight string guitar players and such, uh, because that was not the first album to ever have eight string guitars, but it was the one that popularized it. Mm -hmm. And so there's 10 albums, metal albums from 2002 that I think you all should very much check out and get to know. That's Thank amazing. You Thank so you so much. much. Oh, and I just, you know, the thing that I love about metal and that I love that what has like encompassed everything you've said and everything you've written is just about like embracing the dark and embracing the joy and like just, you know, celebrating all of it. And it's just, it's really amazing. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.